Hey everyone, welcome back to another Ask GN episode. As always, you can leave your questions in the comment section below for the next episode. And this time we have a lot of good ones. It's been a while, but we're back. And I have several questions that have been, excuse me, working here, that have been uh, in the waiting. So thank you for your patience. Let's get into it. Before that, this video is brought to you by Be Quiet and its Straight Power 11 series power supplies. The Straight Power 11 PSUs ship from 450 watts up to 1000 watts, accommodating most of the gaming PC build requirements you'd encounter, and focuses on delivering a higher quality power supply that doesn't sacrifice on efficiency or stability. Noise is also a heavy point for the Straight Power 11, using a 135mm Silent Wings 3 fan that can spin as low as 200 RPM for quieter low load operation. Learn more at the link in the description below. So as always, this is our Q&A section. I'm currently filming at the old studio at the house right now with the OG wood wall over there and Snowflake joining me. And we might teleport to the normal studio in a moment. First question is regarding the Kingpin card. Someone asked, if you were Mr. Moneybags Gamer, how high would you run the power limit for daily use, assuming temps were okay, not in an LN2 application? And because my co-host has left, we might as well move back to the other studio now. So one second and we're back. So the question about basically it's, it comes down to, is it safe to overclock GPUs 24 seven, especially something like a Kingpin video card where it's built for really high power overclocking. And we had some thoughts on this, but went ahead and reached out to Kingpin and Tin anyway. And we also had Jacob from EVGA and Copy as well, who's uh, our main point of contact over there. We got answers from all three. So here's uh, Kingpin's answer was pretty straightforward. It was, quote, I would for sure max it out 144% or whatever allows the card to get the highest stable overclock without throttling. Simple enough. The next comment from Jacob went uh, a, a little bit more detailed on some of it and said, if the viewer means power target, just max it. The card is only going to draw what it needs, just raises the ceiling, and on a normal cooling setup, he would never reach a point that would be detrimental to the GPU. Regarding GPU lifespan under overclocking, without mods, there are enough safeguards built into the GPU to prevent any long-term issues. And went on to say, but if modded, of course, it's a bit unknown. I don't think there is really good data on the long-term effects if you mod the card. And then finally, Tin, Ilya, uh, responded as well. And Tin does the, the power engineering type work on these cards. And also in our lab tour, you can see a lot of his equipment. It's a really cool setup. Ilya said, this is really two questions. One is how power limits affect GPU operation. Increasing power limit allows higher currents or power consumption. However, even at 400 watts, this is 35% higher than rated design spec. Typically, there is quite significant amount of headroom left. As you know, there is a process variance and some GPUs leak more, some less. Maxing out power limits on stock BIOSes, 144% on KPE, without touching voltage will not cause problems. Playing with voltage or load line, however, is a different story. I'm still working on more details about voltage tweaking for RTX KPE, which will be published on EVGA's OC forum section with the card's launch. And uh, just intermission here, it has launched since this answer was provided to us. So that should be out there now. Uh, Ilya went on to say, the second part of the question is, what are safe? Let's assume we want to keep the card in operation for two to three years at least power levels before the GPU starts having issues. This is a bit of a gray area, as NVIDIA and any other ASIC vendor, Intel, AMD, etc., will never publish this sort of data, as it directly represents margins and process parameters, which can often change over time. From our experience, if you keep voltage modest, e.g. 10% increase or less, then it's hard to kill or degrade the chip. All that being said, temperature is much more important as a factor than the power limiter itself, as thermal stress affects not only the silicon die, but the package, PCB assembly and components life, like caps, fans, pumps, you would want to keep the GPU in 30 to 60 degrees Celsius region for maximum lifetime. Temperature is one of the factors why modern smaller nodes cannot operate at high voltages like the old school hardware. As nodes get thinner, operating voltage levels will continue to go lower and power delivery will continue to be even more important in the future. There are already chips out there that can operate from as low as 0.4 volts core voltage. For comparison, old cards like the 9800 GTX 
could work with voltage droop between VRM and GPU as big as 0.4 volts when doing zombie mods. Even with LN2 pots directly attached to the silicon die, transistor density is so high that with high voltage, little transistors already overcook by the time the heat reaches the LN2 pot surface. You may know that all transistors and electronic circuitry on the modern FPGA chips like any CPU or GPU of the last 10 years, is located on the bottom side of the silicon die, one facing the PCB. It answers the question very well. So the answer is you're fine. You can max the slider. The more detailed part of the answer, I, Ilya got all of it, but just to emphasize a few of his points, uh, heat's of concern. So Ilya mentioned that temperature is a uh, point of failure for things like capacitors, fans, and pumps. So to, to expand on that, with a pump, like an Ace Attack pump, the spec for Ace Attack's coolers is no higher than 60 degrees Celsius liquid temperature before there's some uh, permanent loss of liquids through permeation. And uh, EVGA does use Ace Attack as its primary partner for a lot of its cooling products, like the EVGA CLC series, that's all Ace Attack. So the spec follows there. But 60 degrees Celsius liquid temperature is really high. Uh, you would need an extremely hot GPU or CPU to reach that level of liquid temperature. So I don't want people to get scared here and see that their CPU or their GPU is at 60 degrees Celsius, which is actually really good if it's under load, and then think that their liquid will be 60C and freak out and think that it's killing the hardware. It's not. So 60C GPU or CPU temperature is way different than the liquid temperature will ever be. Liquid will be much lower than that. Um, so anyway, keep an eye on liquid temperature. Some of the coolers out there, like the modern Ace Attack stuff, the, uh, some of the Coolit solutions have liquid temperature monitoring built in. They have little thermocouples in there in the liquid, and you can often monitor it through Hardware Info 64 as long as you have that USB cable attached, the same one that controls the LED colors. And uh, you can monitor liquid temperature that way if you're really concerned about it. Or you can stick a probe in yourself if you have an open loop setup. It's much easier to do, but then you're not dealing with the same type of issue uh, because it's an open loop setup. There are a lot of different components in that, so there's different specs for each one. And obviously it shouldn't be too hot, but permeation is not really that much of a concern because you can easily maintain it. So anyway, that's one aspect. The other is capacitors. Uh, typically you have caps that are rated at something like 105 degrees Celsius for 5,000 hours or 10,000 hours, or you might have something, a uh, low end one that's 85 degrees Celsius for 2,000 hours. Now the cap's not always gonna be that hot unless you keep it under 100% load in a really thermally abusive environment. So you don't have to worry about this all too much, but uh, on low end components, certainly the capacitor life is one of the most common points of failure. So if you're in the habit of trying to keep things alive and the uh, you're, you have a motherboard that's been perfectly good but failed or something like that, get good at replacing capacitors because that's probably the most uh, effective way to bring a component back to life. It is often the caps that fail, depending on obviously what you were doing with it before then. But anyway, there's their answers. I, 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 it doesn't seem necessary to expand on this further, but um, yeah, thank you, Ilya, Ten, and Jacob for helping out with that. That is straight from EVGA. So hopefully that helps you out. This would apply, by the way, to most other products as well. So if you buy most video cards off the shelf, you max out the power limit, unless you're going to do what they're saying here, like voltage mods, you'll be fine. So the obvious issue is that it draws more power. Just make sure you have a good enough power supply uh, and you're fine. How do factory tours influence your conclusions? This was a great question. So Addison Martin asked, asked this, I think this was a YouTube comment, I believe. And Addison Martin asked, ask GN, how will all these factory, to all these awesome factory tours, thank you very much, affect your judgment when reviewing new products going forward? Do you think you'll be able to give us consumers a more fair and in-depth review? Absolutely. So this is something we've talked about before, but the really cool thing, the behind the scenes stuff uh, that hasn't made it into those factory tour videos is that we, we get to sit down with these PMs, the product managers, and talk at length before we go through the factory about like, okay, what does all this stuff really cost? And uh, you know, how long does it take? What's the product development life cycle? What's the manpower cost? What's the uh, biggest bottleneck in the pipeline? What are your material limitations? Do you have shortages or issues acquiring materials? Things like that, and that really informs review content because you know the probably the most common complaint in any review is well. 
this is a pretty good product, but to be competitive, it really needs to be like 20 bucks cheaper, 50 bucks cheaper. And it's easy for all of us to say that, of course, because we're not footing the cost to make the product. And you look at the competitive marketplace, and often it is a true statement. To be truly competitive with existing solutions on the market, products do generally need to be cheaper. But to recover some of those initial costs, they often launch at a higher price than we think is uh, fair for the consumer. But doing these types of tours and having that information behind the scenes obviously informs us to know that, well, OK, there's a lot of moving parts here. The price isn't unfair in that it's not asking a significant amount of margin over the cost to make the good, uh, even if it seems like it's unfair as compared to competition. So there's kind of a few points, a few angles of fairness there. And one of them is, is it fair to the uh, consumer from the manufacturer's perspective? And then is it a reasonable price for the consumer to pay from their perspective? And fair from the manufacturer's perspective might be something like with maybe, say, a case or a keyboard. Maybe you're looking at like 30% margin. It might go up to 50% margin on some of these products. And if you're in that range, with that type of product, you're feeling pretty good about it. But uh, obviously, everyone wants to profit more. So it just becomes a question of how much can you push that margin before you restrict your market to a point that you have diminishing returns. You're, you're moving enough less volume that you're making less money versus you know switching it a bit. But uh, that's not something that we really know a whole lot about, typically. But these tours do help us inform, uh, become informed on that. and be a bit smarter when we say what we think was a shortcoming or, or not. Now, another thing that these help with is we do learn what are the manufacturing limitations. So if there is, well, I wish it had X, great example, USB Type-C. A lot of people comment on our case reviews when a case doesn't have USB Type-C and say, I wish this case had USB Type-C in the front. And we've certainly commented on it in the past. Now, Patrick and I, you know, we, we've talked in the last episode about bias in the industry and biases, Patrick and I don't really care about USB Type-C all that much. So when we do a case review, it's reflected that we don't care. Like We barely mention it. And some of you like it a lot. But either way, uh, one of the things we've learned from these factory tours, USB Type-C, not so easy and not so cheap. So when we did our factory tour of the cable factory, we learned that the operators are able to make per operator, a maximum of about six cables per hour. And that's a skilled technician. And it's because of the amount of uh, manual wire routing involved. So that's the bottleneck, is the individual routing the, or sort of splaying the wires. Now, other machines in the process can make tens of thousands of these types of cables per day. It's just at some point you have a bottleneck. And six per hour per person for splaying the wires is obviously a massive bottleneck. We've also learned that the pricing, for example, uh, unfortunately, I can't give specifics on this, but I can say that USB Type-C is somewhere in the range of seven to 10 times more expensive than just a normal USB 3 header on the front of the case, and uh, depending on how much it's been validated. Some of you thought you were making smart ass comments in that video saying, well, but 10 times 20 cents isn't that much, or 10 times 2 cents isn't that It's a, it's a lot more than that. Like, I can't give you a number. I can tell you it's in the dollars range, not in the pennies range. So this is a, a big deal. Like if you want to add USB Type-C to a case, it's not going to happen on a $40 case. It will barely happen on a $50 case if you make a lot of sacrifices. Like if you start cutting corners on quality, if you eliminate fans, then you can make it happen. So you know, this is not a cheap thing. and. Um, that has informed us as well. Uh, other things we've learned, just like, I guess, um, understanding the supply chain. So uh, this was kind of a funny thing, too. I'll go on a tangent here. Um, some people were, were sort of uh, upset about the, like, how cardboard is made and how screws are made, videos, even though the screw one did really well. Um, so the, the kind of funny thing to me is these are the same people often who praise our content for going like really hardcore in depth on detail. And then when we do it for factories, they're like, 
why are you talking about how screws are made? Well, because it's in, it's in literally every single product we review. So it's important to know about. Um, and that's part of like the GN, like let's, let's just go really ham with the depth on this specific thing until there's nothing left to talk about ever again. Uh, so what we learned though, supply chain's massive, obviously. And uh, interestingly, all of these companies, the, the factories are pretty close to each other. So for Cooler Master, Cooler Master works with a cable factory in, I think it's, I, I want to say it's in Shenzhen. They work with a, um, a screw factory in either like Dongguan or Shenzhen as well. They work with a, their main factory is in Huizhou. And if these words mean nothing to you, they're different parts of, uh, of China. And they're all within roughly about maybe an hour to an hour and a half of each other driving. So this is important. And it's, it's interesting to learn because now it's like, oh, okay, so Cooler Master makes the product, they assemble it in this factory in maybe Huizhou, and uh, once it's done in Huizhou, it, it, can, it needs a box. And so they go down the street, 25 minutes, to the box factory, and there's your box. And it's a factory that makes just millions of dollars worth of boxes annually for all kinds of companies. And so there's all these different moving parts to make the product you ultimately get, where by the time you get it, there's been dozens of hands on the product, from the box to the PCB that you may never see inside of the product. And uh, there's also been potentially half a dozen companies that have had hands on some part of the product. And all of that is uh, logistically challenging and expensive, obviously. But you know, it makes more sense still to do this than to, for Cooler Master as another example, to make its own screws. Because that's just why. Why would they bother doing that when they can go to a factory that makes millions of them a month? and get them for far cheaper than using their own expensive floor space to put like a screw shop, like a, a screw machining shop. Let's rephrase that. So anyway, yeah, it's really taught us a lot. And um, I don't know, I think going forward, what new perspective will we have for consumers? I think the perspective we will have is I'll be able to, to give you all more detail on, you know, why does this product cost what it does? And then, okay, let's go through some of the materials now that I, I know more about material costs, time costs, and let's see if it's fair. Let's see if it's actually a reasonable price for the manufacturer to charge, whether or not it's reasonable for you to pay it given the competitive landscape. We can always look at it in a, a vacuum from that perspective. So that'll help. And then uh, stuff like knowing timelines will help significantly because now I understand better like, uh, how long it takes to make different types of products. And we kind of knew this before, but now we, we better understand which part takes so long. So tooling can take several months to get tooling made and finalized and can cost upwards of a million dollars to make all of it. And, uh, and so that's valuable to know because now we know when we get a case in here, as an easy example, we know that the, the tooling for that case, if it's not been reused, has been finalized for at least six months at this point, likely, maybe three depending on how fast the company is at making their product. So um, it's all valuable to know, but I don't, don't want to go, go too crazy on this. But um, yeah, I guess other, one other thing too, the MSI Radiation Lab tour we did was very educational because we learned you know, about all these different certifications that companies have to get to sell in different regions of the world. And that's uh, tremendously involved. I mean, MSI, as an example, they have their own semi anechoic chamber. It's not like the most advanced one I've ever been in, but it's more advanced than most people have. And they have their own radiation lab. And these things aren't to slap a CE label on their products, but it's to validate that their product meets to spec. They have a, a pretty uh, tight tolerance for it. And as long as it meets the spec, what they then do is send that product out to be validated by a third party really expensive lab and get the government or the organization stamps on it that they need. Um, so that was really interesting to learn as well as, you know, like all these small steps you don't even think about. Like a video card is tremendously complex, obviously, not even counting the GPU. And you kind of take some stuff for granted, like the uh, IO, display port, HDMI, not something we really think too hard about. And certainly not something we think needs validating at this point for the most part because it's so known. But uh, every one of these cards and motherboards has to go through validation and that's a lot of extra steps. So uh, what else, what's the next, let's do the next question. That was a great one though. I do want to talk about it some more, but we'll stop there. <laughs> next one, where does G, oh actually, 
quick note, please, for those of you watching this, please leave more questions about the factory tours below. I saw a lot of questions about the factory tours, about like manufacturing in China, being in China, working with the companies, uh, touring the different facilities, how automation works, uh, how different products are made and stuff like that. Please leave your questions below. I saw a lot of them on the factory tours, but it's much easier for me to collect them if they are down there in the comment section of AskGN. Uh, you can also post them to the Patreon Discord if you would like to, So, uh, where we have the bonus episode of AskGN. Anyway, um, yeah, I would love to answer more factory questions. Please leave them in the comments. Next one, where does GN draw the line for depth? Adam Queen said, hi, Steve. I'm always wondering which level of knowledge a good tech journalist needs to make great content. One of the advantages of GN is sometimes GN has a much deeper dig into the implementation details other than just benchmarking. But on the other hand, I never see GN talking about source code level things like compiler IR, which is commonly used in graphics drivers and would impact performance. I totally understand digging too deep into source code if there is would make GN more like open source mail list, but too shallow also makes GN not so GN. So how does GN balance between a hardcore source code FPGA spec level details against plain benchmarking, although the GN method of benchmarking is already more scientific than a lot of other tech tubers? So, um, good question. Driver level source code isn't something we're doing. So, uh, and I, I suspect you obviously understand that given your question. Um, where do we draw the line is how I'm going to interpret this question. I think where we draw the line is largely based upon our level of competence and knowledge in the topic. So uh, over the years, one thing longtime viewers will have noticed is that we've gotten more detailed and more confident in the details as we've gone. So one thing that we've sort of phased out is in video card reviews, CP reviews, we basically never show a spec sheet anymore of what the product has for specs. Like I'll, I'll talk through it for a minute or so before we get into the charts, but we don't just show the spec sheet. What we used to do is spend maybe five minutes talking about just basically reading the spec sheet and then might deviate a little bit and explain what some of these things mean. But years and years ago, my knowledge wasn't, our knowledge as a team wasn't there to really expand on it. So it was reading a brochure and I didn't really like that content approach. Uh, we've now eliminated it. We understand these specs at this point. We've explained them in great detail in other content pieces, but um, we've mostly eliminated going through the spec sheet because it's like we know enough now about other aspects of the product that if it's something you can just look up on our website or another website and look at a spec sheet, there's really no reason for us to spend minutes reading it on. It's, it's so inefficient to read it on camera compared to just looking at it. So that's something we've eliminated. We've drawn a line uh, sort of at the low end of like this is not interesting enough to get into the video. It's, it's not something we can provide enough value on because it's literally reading a spec sheet. So we drew a line at the bottom end, cut that out, and made an extra couple of minutes of up to five minutes that we can spend on other stuff, which is obviously very important. Um, we draw lines at, we try to keep it at like 20 to 25 minutes max for most reviews. For really important content, I'll allow up to about 30. Occasionally we go over 30, but 30 is like a, a really hard limit of, um, it's a psychological limit. It's kind of like when you see something that's $9.99, $9.99 instead of 10. Uh, so 29 minutes versus 31 minutes. There's a big difference in how many people will click on the video. So that's where we draw the line in terms of content length. Now that dictates a bit where we draw the line for content depth because at some point we have to cut it off for time reasons to make sure the video is seen. We have to cut it off for financial reasons because if I want to sustain the channel, then sometimes it makes more sense to split content into multiple pieces and have two 20 minute episodes instead of one 40 minute episode. Um, and this isn't just a financial thing either. It's a, we put a lot of work into this and want to make sure people actually see it because it's disappointing if they don't. So sometimes that makes more sense. In terms of depth answering your question, if it's a topic I don't feel great about in my depth of knowledge and none of my team members uh, know much about it, then we'll do some research. We'll try to talk to some experts if it's an important topic and maybe include some quotes from them, but we're not going to expand on it from there because it's, it's obvious when you're out of your depth and it doesn't provide any value to speak in vagaries and ambiguity. And sometimes we do speak in ambiguity and vagaries. Normally it's for reasons that are related to NDAs or embargoes um, to try and get like a little bit of information out there without breaking any rules. But uh, yeah, just, 
if it's not something we know a lot about, that's that's the line. So um, obviously, our knowledge base as a team is expanding as we grow. Andrew's been working on things like RTX and DXR in Unreal Engine, so that has informed us greatly in that aspect of things. Patrick's been learning more about the games he's testing, the software he's testing. We've done research on all these different software solutions for CPU benchmarks, learning more about how case thermals behave. And so all of this allows us to get more detail in our reviews, but it's a, it's a really gradual growing process. And to just, we're not, uh, to use your example again, we're not going to jump into something like source code level discussion because we don't understand it. So I could find someone who could put some words in my mouth, but that doesn't really seem genuine. Um, so the most we'll do for that kind of stuff is if it's a really interesting topic, it's likely I don't know what's interesting because I don't know enough about the topic to know that it's interesting. So if it's an important topic, always feel free to let us know. Twitter is an easy way at GamersNexus. Patreon Discord is a great one. You go to patreon.com slash GamersNexus, tag me on the Discord. I see them. I don't always respond, but I do see them and read them. And, um, and then what we can do is reach out to some experts and hopefully get some answers and minimally mention their answers, uh, but might not go into depth beyond that if we're not knowledgeable in the area. Hopefully that answers it, though. It's, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward and genuine. It's, it's do we understand it, yes or no. Um, now, obviously, stuff we understand doesn't always get in the video either just because of content length or maybe it doesn't really fit the topic or whatever, but you can always post uh, a simple comment or tag us on Discord or whatever, Twitter, and let us know, like, hey, I noticed that you guys didn't mention this, this aspect of the product. Could you expand on that? And maybe we'll find time to do so in a news topic or something. When is replacing GPU paste worth it? Gam says, how old does a GPU have to be before disassembling to replace stock paste becomes a worthwhile endeavor? So, um, dust mostly is the answer. Uh, it is worth replacing it as soon as like the coolers just disgusting. Once you notice that your thermals are you're unhappy with them, and it might be immediately, then it's it's worth replacing it. Now, some cards is worth replacing right away. It depends on the quality of the card, and uh, in general, the paste from factory is not always that great. So you can typically get improvements by throwing like even just some cheap like Arctic on there. Arctic MX4 or something will often be an improvement over the factory level application. Uh, Thermal Grizzly, of course, is a long time sponsor of ours. I don't know if they're I don't think they're sponsoring, we, I think we've served their ads for the month, but uh, so Cryonaut, if you want something really high end and expensive and good, that's another option. But um, the, the answer is, is it hotter than you're comfortable with? And also, if you're overclocking it and you feel like you can get a couple more megahertz improvement with a lower temperature, which every five degrees matters, then it's time to replace the paste. Uh, but yeah, I would probably go based on uh, when you do your first dust cleansing of the whole system, it might be a good time to, to, to replace the paste and just, you know, don't expect wonders, but you should expect some improvement, especially if dust is like getting in there. It's, you know, it's small. It can kind of get around the edges of the, the cold plate and really make things gross. Uh, let's do just two more. Apparently this Sony a7-3R turns off after like 30 minutes, so, or it doesn't, it stops recording. So we're redoing the last two questions here. Uh, Swifty Bastard from the GN Discord asks, Steve, what do the lines at the end of your bar charts mean? Why are they only for 1% lows, 0.1% low bars, and not the average bars for FPS comparisons? So we answered this already in the GN Discord, which you can join by going to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Post your questions. I answered it previously, but there is also a bar on the average one. It's just it's so small because the deviation on that chart is basically zero for average that you couldn't really see it. But uh, so the bars, at the end of the chart, there's this little eye that was rotated 90 degrees. And that eye indicates the, it's sort of a bracket of our standard deviation, our margin of error, depending on the test and the chart, to illustrate when a benchmark is, uh, is meaningfully different and measurably different than another product that was benchmarked. So the point of adding those was to bring some reality back to the benchmarking space where People are, are so often a, attached to one company exceeding or succeeding over the other one that they forget that a difference of two FPS might be completely margin of error and totally irrelevant. Now, even if it's not margin of error and it's measurable, it's still imperceptible in that example, so it's still irrelevant, but for a different reason. So 
uh, not every test is the same. Tests are all imperfect. And the variance for different types of tests can be quite large or it could be basically nothing, like in the chart you noticed. 0.1% lows, 1% lows have a pretty wide variance because the nature of them is that it's a more restricted set of data, it's excursions from the mean, and so that ends up being where you'll have that, uh, that margin of error, that standard deviation bar on the chart, be a bit wider. So if we see something like a result that's 80 FPS, 0.1% low for product A, and 68 FPS, 0.1% low for product B, if the two numbers there are within that deviation of each other, they're within error of each other, you cannot fairly state that the one with 80 is better than the one at 68. Because if they're within, especially if they're well within error, maybe there's like a 12 FPS variance on that chart, then it is unfair to come to that conclusion because you can't. We wouldn't have the, the test resolution to declare that one is significantly meaningfully better than the other, uh, even if the data reflects that these two numbers have ones bigger than the other. So the point is just, you know, when you're looking at the charts, we do this and script around it, so hopefully you don't have to do too much work. But if you're looking at the charts and um, trying to determine which product's better than the other, take a look at those bars. We try to get them on every chart, sometimes we miss it, but take a look at the bars, and if you see two results are within range of each other, they're really not meaningfully different. Like we can't, uh, we can't see a difference in, in our testing procedure, our testing method for that game. So yeah, what we do is we take all the test results, we get standard deviation, or we calculate margin of error, depending. And, um, and then with that, we can determine how much variance there is run to run for each game, for each product. So if you have like a game that's scoring in the range of 200, 300 FPS, you could easily have, uh, depending on the game, the engine, a variance of maybe like 10. And so if we have a product that's at 300 FPS, another product that's at 292 FPS, it, you could say that the one at 300 is better, or you could be realistic and look at the error bars and see that actually they are functionally the same. And that's normally the phrasing that we use when we describe results that are within error. So um, that's what it's just, you know, keep, keep your expectations within the realm of uh, reality because testing is all imperfect. And so everything's going to have some error baked in. Uh, not all results are significant in terms of their superiority over the next result down on the chart. And you could have things that are fairly close to each other that are actually basically the same at the end of the day. Um, so not getting too caught up in really small differences. And then I guess other than that, you know, we, we build these data sets based on when you see a chart with like 20 CPUs or GPUs or whatever, and you see a review go up uh, that might have multiple different games tested with a lot of different products, there's thousands and thousands of cells of data there that we go through uh, for all these tests, for all these products and all these games. And so when you end up with really complicated reviews, there's really, there's a lot of data to look at and start piecing together uh, what kind of range you have for each game and should we eliminate this product or this game from the test because the variance is too high and it can't be trusted or whatever. Um, so anyway, yeah, the answer is those bars illustrate the expected uh, or the known test range based on looking at all the data we have and coming to a margin of error or a standard deviation for that title. So that's the answer to that one. Uh, next one, last one was Smoke Father two months ago said, Steve looks like a retired wrestler. I think you're thinking of Hype Beast Steve, who last made an appearance at CES, my long lost cousin. That's it for this one. As always, if you want to leave questions in the comment section below, we'll try to get them for next time. If you come up with a question in two or three weeks from now and want to make sure it's seen, post it on this video, not on a future video. Uh, come back here and post it here so I can see it. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus, support us there, and join our Discord through the integration and post your comment in the uh, Ask GN questions section where I will look through for the next episode. We have a patrons Ask GN episode going up separately on that channel. So if you want to check it out and you're a Patreon backer, you can get access to that uh, or you can sign up and get access to it. And yeah, I store at cameras.net to pick up a shirt, like a teal version of this one. This was limited, but there's still teal one out there. Uh, or the mod mats. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.